you have seen this announcement around the college relative to a workshop next week on Wednesday afternoon and evening with Nadir Khalili, who will be our Monday night guest lecturer. And this is a hands-on opportunity to become involved with Mr. Khalili in his method of constructing adobe shelters, adobe dwellings, uh, a very unique system which he'll be talking about Monday night, uh, what he calls uh, Getalften, earth, fire, water, and air, I believe. And it's a process of actually firing shelter, uh, as you would a ceramics piece, and uh, it has been used in primitive and ancient periods in Iran. Iran. Uh, he will be leaving here early Tuesday morning next week to go to NAS Nassau, not Nassau, N-A-S-A-U, but Nassau, N-A-S-A, in Washington, D.C., to provide a paper there on uh, constructing shelters using moon soil, using this process. And then he'll come back on Wednesday morning and run the workshop with us. So I do need your registration by tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock because we have to order the clay and other material that, go with it, that goes with this. And I would uh, we've suggested that you sign up uh, in pairs because he would like you to be working in, in teams of two, uh, each of you constructing a shelter from 25 pounds of clay. And uh, we'll try to accommodate as many people as we possibly can. So by 5 o'clock to, uh, tomorrow afternoon, if you would please sign in with the architecture secretary or the landscape architecture secretary, uh, we'd appreciate your participation. It's $4 for each person to pay for materials. So if you have friends uh, around campus or of others who might like to participate in this uh, workshop, uh, please ask them to uh, sign in. Anyone is welcome. This evening, we have Mr. James Rose from Ridgewood, New Jersey, landscape architect, who will be speaking to us on the heavenly environment and other crimes. And uh, Mr. Rose comes to us with some 46, seven years of practice and study in landscape architecture. He studied at Cornell and at Harvard and has been practicing, uh, writing, lecturing since the uh, late 30 period. He and uh, Garrett Ekbo and Dan Kiley were the driving force while still students at Harvard in a new consciousness about a modern movement, a school of thought in landscape architecture to bring it in line with the other art areas of architecture and the arts, sculpture, painting, which was moving very rapidly at that time. Uh, however, landscape architecture uh, was not moving in, in haste with that particular and so we're very, very uh, honored to have Mr. Rose with us this evening, a person who has had a formidable contribution uh, to the movement in landscape architecture and to the periods uh, of uh, a very exciting period of its development. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. James Rose. going to say this is not the first noose I've had around my neck. Um, 
Our today, this, the, a student asked a question that, in retrospect, sounds very interesting. Uh, it had to do with, I think it was placed, whether I preferred working for an individual client <clears throat> or working for a larger group as, let's say, a YMCA corporation or, or that type of group. And I had never thought about it before because to me, a, a job is a job and I just handle whatever comes up. And I think the answer is <clears throat> that there is really no different. You see, the, the, the thought behind in the student's mind, I think, was that you were dealing with one person when you uh, uh, were doing a private house. Uh, and when you were doing a corporation, you were uh, dealing with large numbers of persons and you had all these people to satisfy. And I think that just the opposite can be true, that in a private house, you can be uh, uh, subject to all the ideas of neighbors, building inspectors, uh, 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 sidewalk kibitzers, uh, plus the family, the in-laws, the grandmother, the grandfather, and all the other people that come on Sundays and well-wishers who bring a little tree in a pot and you're supposed to find a place for this in the scheme of things. Uh, this can be just as difficult as, or, and sometimes more so, especially when the building inspector gets into the act, can be uh, terribly difficult and uh, just as bad as dealing with the corporation where you may have to deal with just one person and it could be simpler. So uh, I think there is an illusion in the minds of some people who haven't practiced yet or haven't practiced very long that there is a great deal of difference. And I, I think the answer to it is that uh, each job is a unique thing in itself and there's no way of, of saying that class of things you can treat that way and this class you treat another way. And in the uh, slides that I uh, want to start by showing, it goes uh, from, uh, I think the first group is a corporate job. And I will, as we look at the slides, I'll try to explain what the difficulties were or the good parts in making that come to be. Uh, I, I personally find a corporate job very easy to do, but uh, I haven't done so many that I can say I know all about corporate jobs. Uh, I, then after, the, the slides are divided into four or five different groups, and after each section, after each group, I will uh, stop and we'll turn on the lights and if there are any questions or discussion, we can do it at that time. The reason for that is that if we go through four or five, and then you ask questions about number three, I may not remember which number three was. So I think we could, we could start the slides, and I'll, I'll just explain what is happening as the slides go along. Yes, this is the, a corporate job, uh, and this is the, the front entrance to it. Uh, this has been done in the past two or three years. It took approximately two years to bring to the state that it is at, but the corporation got more successful and they made an addition and we're now working on the second part of it. Incidentally, I don't have slides that cover the whole Thing, but only I will uh, tell you as much as I can what happened in the in the whole process of doing it. Uh, so, oh, I forgot I'm supposed to do this. Yeah, uh, you will. See, what you saw on the previous slide was a uh, simply a front view. You come in from the parking area. This looks toward the main entrance, and you see a piece of sculpture there on the right. Uh, which is one that the clients or the corporation bought. 
and uh, said, what shall we do with it? Where shall we put it? And that's where it got located, and it will appear in a couple of other slides. Uh, these basins of water have become a very important part of the uh, whole landscape process. See, there, there is looking back toward the uh, drive. That is not a public street. That is the drive for the corporation. Uh, you get another view of the, uh, the sculpture that they bought and uh, had to be incorporated in the scheme. There it is again. That, that uh, I, I don't know, I don't remember the sculptor's name, but it is, it is quite a well-known piece. There you are looking past it, past the building. The building on the right is where the, a conference room is that looks out on what you see beyond. And as you can see, there are uh, several other arrangements, sculpture-like arrangements in the background. And they will, you will see uh, more close-up views of those. Incidentally, all these, all these trees were uh, on the property and we moved them with one of those enormous machines that grabs up a whole machine at one time and they can move about six trees a day. And we must have had them there for a couple of weeks making screening, planting. And, uh, and incidentally, all, every single one of those has survived. There wasn't a single uh, fatality. Now, we are a little further than that metal sculpture that you just looked at. And this is one in one of the uh, little, let's call them ponds. <coughs> now that originated from two tree roots of trees that were torn down, cut down, taken away, and they left the roots there. And the roots looked very interesting. They were there during all this construction and uh, I wouldn't let anybody take them away because I thought maybe they had some, they wanted to be someplace. And so I put the two together. Those are two tree roots interlocked that uh, make a piece of sculpture. Now, this is from the conference room I was telling you about a moment ago looking out on the metal sculpture and out toward the street again. Uh, around those uh, uh, trees, you see a depression in the ground. There was a drainage problem there, and we uh, simulated a stream bed uh, where the water could collect, and it uh, uh, slowly dissipates itself into the ground. And there's also, just slightly to the left of the sculpture is a stone bridge made out of the same bluestone that you see in the foreground here that brings you across that, that uh, stream. There we are back to the root, root sculpture again. And all these rocks were on the property and are simply taken and arranged. Uh, in the middle of the picture, there is one that is arranged so that it becomes a lantern at night and has uh, an electric light in it. The one on the, on the left is just a plain stone arrangement. Uh, on, on the left also is a continuation of that stream that you saw uh, with the bridge across it. Well, we are back. I, did I, I pushed the wrong button, that's all. All right, that's a close-up on the roof business. Right there. And also, you can see the lantern a little better. There is, within 50 feet of that planting there, is a highway. And that's why we moved in all those trees that were existing on the property to that location to screen out the driveway. So that if, if you took those trees out, the road, public road, would look as close as the, their private road did in the previous picture. 
Ah, there it is again. Now, now you can really see that it is two, two roots mounted together. On a uh, piece of bluestone, there is a, uh, a submersible pump in there that pumps the water to recirculate the water, and there's also a light. And then you're looking back toward the building uh, where the offices are. Something is, the slides seem to be repeating themselves. So. Oh, all right. <clears throat> now, this is a little further down, and that is a pagoda like figure which was also constructed on the job. And it is a symbol of a uh, tortoise, uh, which is supposed to mean long life. Uh, but that was, that was constructed out of material there and on the job. There's a closer view of it. Now, this is the same figure in a different perspective. In the previous picture, it looked larger in scale, but this is the same. again. And this is from the inside looking up. This is from the uh, owners. I don't know what his title is, but he's the one who owns the corporation. Uh, this is from his office. And that's another from the interior, looking back at the at the root sculpture. Oh, all right. Uh, I wanted to. Oh, no, I wanted to wait on that. Did I? Oh, I can do it this way. Okay. Can we have a light? Uh, I just wanted to mention that. <clears throat> I don't have the pictures to show it, but I can tell you that if you continued around that building, uh, there is a 50-foot space between the building, which where the setback line is, and the property line. And that's where the electric service comes in. And that is the area that is foreboding. And I'm terribly sorry, I don't have, it isn't that I forgot to bring them, I just don't have slide pictures. I have many pictures that will appear in the forthcoming book. But uh, in that, we have violated all the rules that you can think of. Because the electric company wants that kept absolutely clear, so that in case they have to come in to fix a wire or a cable or something, it would break. Uh, this is something that might happen. Uh, once in five years, it might happen not at all, or it might happen every two years or something like that. But with the client that I had, I made the uh, agreement that uh, we would pay no attention to that rule, that you could do nothing. And we uh, built a landscape that has in it a, a I call it a tea house, and uh, more waterworks and pools and planting, uh, uh, but they're always allowing space in case an emergency truck should have to come in. They would be able to do it, but if you just looked at it, you wouldn't guess it was uh, any possibility of a roadway. Uh, however, this is so far three or four years old, and there's never been any uh, need for anybody to come in. And also, there has never been any complaint by the electric company. I, I don't know exactly why, uh, but I think that they are sort of, uh, uh, I think they would be bucking something like City Hall if they tried to uh, 
make us take anything down. Uh, but that is a chance that the owner was liable to take, and this is uh, just only one of the many crimes that have been committed in, the, in this place. Yes. Not completely planning the site out. Site out. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah that's the impression that I got from the book. You kind of let things happen. Well, I do. Do you prevent them? <laughs> I mean, they happen, they will. You know, if it rains, I let it rain. I mean, as far as designs. Yeah, well, uh, uh, pretty much the same thing. When, uh, when the thing comes about, it comes about. I, it's very hard to force it. You can try. To me, always looks forced. Uh, no, I, I, I don't have any mystic belief in uh, um, uh, that if you get things right on paper, they'll be right on the ground. Especially with landscape, because there are always things that uh, come up uh, that you cannot expect. And I, I, in, in one of the later pictures, I'll show you a whole job that was done that way. That, that uh, uh, if, you, if you get your plan, and I understand, I'm not advising you not to finish your plans. I don't want you to take that interpretation, because in a school you certainly do. Because that's what you do in a school, is make plans. You don't make gardens or uh, landscapes or anything else. You make plans and models. And if you think you're making the other thing, you've really got a problem. This is one of the things that we have talked about uh, since I have been here, is uh, the idea of internships and things of that kind, where you get experience in actually doing something. But there's a great difference between drawing a, a, a plan or a section or an elevation or a model and actually doing it. It's, uh, one precedes the other, but I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. And there's no, I don't know of any way of getting around that. And so I allow enough flexibility so that when the unexpected happens, it doesn't throw me or I don't have to discard it. And I'll show you how that worked. Or even now, I can give you a little forward on that. <coughs> there was a job. I think it's the slides that come after this one, but maybe the ones after that, where uh, uh, as we were working the ground, you know, digging holes and all the things that you do, the grading, a lot of stones turned up. And uh, they were all put in a great big pile. And I was thinking, what am I going to do with those stones? Now, it didn't tell me on the plan. It never could. I didn't even know the stones were there. But they accumulated, and they were there. So I think, well, how can I use those? And of course, you can always hire a truck and take them away and dump them illegally some other place. But uh, uh, so then I went home, and uh, uh, you know, uh, during before I came back to the job again, I thought, oh, I know what I'm do with those stones. And I came back, and the backhoe guy. Or rather, the stones had disappeared. And so I was, hey, where are the stones? I wanted to do something with them. Oh, the back hole guy said, uh, oh, those, those are junk stones. He said, I buried them. And so I said, well, you get your back hole out here and unbury them because I want to use them. See? And th this is what happens. Now, you make a drawing in advance that covers that. If you do, you'll be able to predict the weather and a number of other things that other people don't do successfully. Uh, so I, I, I'll show you. I, that's just a, a forward on it, but I'll show you when that, it comes. This kind of thing that was that influenced that whole job that could not possibly have been put on uh, original drawings, or if it had been and then contracted out would have had to eliminate that whole idea. And I leave it flexible 
so that I can take advantage and the plan doesn't run me or take advantage of me. Now that, I am not saying don't plan. I'm saying do plan, but I mean don't let it take over because there are things that are stronger than plans. You know how many plans have gone awry, don't you? <laughs> Quite a few. Uh, all right, let's, let's see what the next uh, thing is about. Oh, no, th this is not the one, it's the one after this. I put this in as, uh, in, the, in the book I call it uh, uh, Suburbia Transformed. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a before picture on this, but if you, it should be easy for anyone to visualize a typical suburban house standing with a grass lawn coming up to it, and a street going by it, and uh, then this next door is the same and the same and the same. Uh, but this is after some planning had been done. This is where you enter the place, and there have been some trees planted along a walk that tend to subdue or obscure somewhat this suburban house. There is another view of it that was totally exposed to the street, but it has been made into an entrance courtyard. Those shojis are movable, as you'll see in uh, some of the next pictures, which goes into a, a garden so that it becomes an entrance that is private from the street. Uh, and I'll, oh, I'll tell you later. Yeah, this is a view down that line of trees that go to the front door that I showed you before, that were not there and you, you uh, saw the whole house with its bare face sticking out. There is a side view of the same thing trees uh, uh, lined against the house. Now the entrance courtyard is on the other side that you cannot see at all from here because in that dark spot is all heavy screen planting. Now we are back to the entrance court and this is where you come in. Uh, and you can go, if you go on the path to the right, you come to the front door. If you go through the shojis, you go into the garden and, and pool. Uh, which incidentally, uh, is almost the same month this job was completed, uh, they had a wedding and the, the daughter was married in this uh, setting, uh, you know, like 20 feet from the street. Now this is with the shoji doors open and you get a view through to the pool and the garden beyond. Is another one of a pool. It doesn't have to be a rectangular pool. That uh, was part of the plan. Uh, oh, I should mention that beyond that is a stream which uh, uh, I don't have pictures of, but it's a, it's a very nice uh, uh, brook-like stream that everybody is frightened to death of, and they've never done anything with it uh, because they're afraid to afraid to touch it. And I, I, I haven't been able to convince them to do anything with it. But from uh, that rail and that seat over there, you can look down into a stream. <laughs> That's another picture of the in. This is in a heavy, heavy suburban setting, uh, but it is screened from neighboring properties and from the street and everything else. And that's pretty much the same view that you saw before. I'll go back to it. Not, 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 the, uh, not the mass of trees that is there. There were additional trees supplementing what was there. But there were trees along the brook. And the brook is right down there. Now, the, of course, that uh, black pine in the foreground was brought in. All the, all the trees that are uh, standing by themselves. But, uh, and, and the, where necessary, we reinforced the planting with screen planting. But there was the basic planting there.
along the street. Yeah, that that uh, uh, looks as though it's far away from suburbia, but it isn't. It's right in the same place. Now we are back to the uh, entrance, and as you see, there is a, a counter there, and uh, uh, th those are wood decks surrounding the pool, and this is where the the wedding was. I don't know. What do you do? Give or perform? This is, is uh, true suburbia, you know, I mean, it's nothing uh, uh, a little bit out in the country or anything like that. And just showing you a few details of the steps into the pool. Uh, and there is a view back toward the shojis, which when they're closed, that that's street, it's about 40 feet from those shorties going back. I don't take any responsibility for the house itself. These are just simply different angles. Okay. Now, I, I think we, we can just continue with the next badge because uh, that gets to the point I was making before. Unless someone has some questions, if you want, we will. All right. Hold, hold it one minute. Yes? About the what? Oh, yes. Are you talking about the metal sculpture? Oh, 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 how did it come to be? Uh, no, I, I just went ahead and did it. I didn't ask anybody. You know, the, the materials were there, and uh, uh, I felt it was called for and went and did it, and everybody's been very happy with it. I, I think that's the gist of your question, isn't it? Whether, whether, whether somebody said, "Won't you please put a piece of sculpture there?" No, nothing like that. Oh, I'm sorry. The one I was referring to comes after this, but this does have an interesting point, and that is <clears> that this is a job that I was called in on by the client after they have the conversation on the telephone, my first conversation with them, they said to me, we are friends of Sontok, another client of mine. Uh, we have uh, been working for three years on our landscape with a landscape architect, and <clears throat> we have spent $60,000, and we don't see the kind of improvement we expected to see. It could be our fault, and maybe we just don't know what's going on, but we would like you to come over and give us an opinion about it. Uh, now, oh, so I went over. What you see here is where a semicircular driveway came to the front door. If you go up those steps and turn uh, left, you, that's where the front door is. Uh, on the right and out of the picture is a parking area so that you can drive your car in, park, but you don't have any semicircular driveway to go around. Now, the first day that I came there, this drive, which was just about enough for two cars, for a car to pass a, a car standing there, but I didn't know whether I should leave my car there because if another car did come and park, then the whole driveway would be blocked. In other words, there was no parking facilities made. Uh, all right, we'll continue. This is a, a, a closer view of the, of the same thing. The uh, 
front door itself is in the shadow. I, I can't help that. So we'll see some more pictures. This is as you come up the steps further, and you will. Uh, uh, oh, see, you see, there is a a pool there, uh, which is on the platform that was made at the front door where the previous driveway had been. And also, the, the stone you see standing there in the water uh, was brought down from Bear Mountain, which is about 60 miles away, uh, uh, by some people who have handled stones for me before. And that stone is a very heavy one. There's a Another close-up view, uh, and if you if you continue on that path, you come to another area which we will see soon. There, there is the path going down, and as you can see in the in the distance is a um, I don't know what you call it. I, I like I call it a rocker. Uh, Rock Ikebana is what I call it, but it's a rock arrangement. Uh, and that is where the road, the entrance road formerly went, but it is no longer there. And this is what, there's another view across the pool and over to the rock area. And there is the rock area. Now, where the road went, there was a drainage problem, and that was partly the reason it was done in this way, to, uh, to be able to uh, let the water slope off onto the main street. All right, now can we have some lights, because I've, I've, I'm sure there are some. You see, these these pictures are uh, not the complete coverage, so that's why there is undoubtedly going to be some questions. Yes, yes. Let me repeat that and see if I have it right. Do I use pebbles instead of grass to for a drainage area? Well, it's not. It's not an either-or situation. Uh, uh, the pebbles on a flat area like that serve the purpose very well. I mean, do you miss grass? Is that what you're saying? Ah, well, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't hear you. Okay. For ecological purposes? You mean the pebbles are out? <laughs> well, all right. I mean, uh, I think uh, you see what we, that, that's a criticism of the Rwanji Garden in Kyoto. It hasn't got uh, any grass, anything, uh, sand instead of pebbles, and no plants. I mean, I, I really don't understand. The, the the grass is the savior of of anything really. Well, I, all right. I mean, I think you should check the author. <laughs> I would question that as a as a you know as a bona fide statement. I, I can live very nicely without grass. It's a uh, an awful lot of trouble. Cutting grass is uh, kind of idiot labor. Uh, you see, it's not interesting to do. Uh, and if it, it helps the environment, it certainly doesn't help the person who does the work. So I, I would question grass as a savior of anything, really. <laughs> uh, is there any other questions?
right. Well, I, I didn't finish with my story about the visit. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't park. I mean, there's a bad parking situation because you can get one car there and that's all there was to it. That was the end of the parking. So I went into the house and we, uh, uh, to talk with these people. And they showed me where the, whoever had done it, and I didn't know his name or anything else, except they said he was a landscape architect. Uh, and I, after I looked over the whole place, I s told them that I thought the person who did it had simply gotten himself into a problem that was over his head or over his ability, that he didn't know how to handle it. And I found out that what he had done when they said, well, you know, this doesn't seem to do anything, he brought in a thousand more bulbs and five more trees and kept uh, uh, filling the place up with plants. And one of the things he had in the, in the back was a checkerboard pattern of bluestone. And in the on the red side in the checkerboard was uh, bulbs coming up. And uh, uh, they weren't coming up at the time I saw them. They had been planted there. And it was kind of a, you know, kind of a dull idea. Uh, the tennis court, which they had, uh, was totally open, ex uh, uh, exposed in a way that you could not really see the tennis game. You saw it from an oblique angle down the long side of the court. Uh, and what we did was rework the whole thing. I changed the, the uh, elevation, brought uh, the grade up about four feet, separated the tennis court from the uh, uh, swimming pool, and uh, uh, really re ended up by redoing the whole property. Now, this is what I consider or classify as a tour de force. See, where you have a problem that uh, um, uh, where things have been done that should, that don't make it flow easily, and you have to use devices in order to make it a reasonable uh, solution. I, again, I don't have a uh, slides that cover the back side, that, but they are, will be in the book when, if and when it ever comes out. It is the publisher is uh, um, um, taking an awful long time to get it out. I don't know what the publication date is. But the, the point to this was that I discovered that the man who did it was a nurseryman and not a landscape architect, although he was in the yellow pages as such. These people called him in on that basis and spent $60,000 in three years uh, developing the property and felt that they had nothing. And I agreed with that, that they had nothing but an overplanted place. And uh, when I took over, uh, I told the foreman that was going to work on it that you went down, incidentally, this is about a stone's throw from Nixon's new place that he bought there. But I, I told the foreman that you <clears throat> go down such and such a street, you turn right, you go to the end of that, and you'll see a place that's been planted to death. And uh, he called me up and said, your description was perfect. I found it right away. That's what had happened. Now, we took the same plants. And the reason I included these slides was really a, a message uh, for the ASLA and the message for students who will later be members of the ASLA that, uh, that there is this kind of uh, takeover of the trades who are not qualified to do the job. And how you prevent it, I don't know. But I think that this is something that an organization that calls itself the American Society of Landscape Architects ought to investigate. At war with the nursery trade?
Well, you know, there's more than one nursery. I don't, uh, I don't have any trouble. I just, uh, uh, you know, call them up at the planning season and give them a list of things and when can they deliver it. And, you know, there's no, it's just a straight. of that is wrong. It's not hostility, but if you, uh, let's say you had an appendix and you found out that the orderly in the hospital was taking it out, you might get a little annoyed that you didn't have a doctor who was qualified. And that's not hostility, that's just common sense. I have no hostility against the nursery. I hope they work as qualified nurserymen and not try to be either doctors, lawyers, or Indian chiefs because then they look a little silly. And that's what happened here. And that's not hostility. It's just uh, regret. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's sad regrets. And also I feel a little sorry for the client who got taken to the tune of $60,000 and delayed three years from getting anything worth having. I don't feel the least bit hostile. Yes. Yes. You see, this is why I wanted to stop, because I'm afraid there'd be too many and we wouldn't be able to relate back. Yes. When did the what start? Oh, oh, well, the answer to the first thing is no. I did not. Uh, uh, I felt it was the wrong architect, not a good architect. Uh, the client was stuck with it. They felt the same as I did. Uh, they, no, no, no. This went on at the same time. And I had contact with the architect and consultation and so forth. But I don't think that it, the reason that architect was chosen was that he was had a reputation of fast, like fast food, you know? Well, you got fast building. And, and uh, they had a very good architect, Eleanor Pedersen, in that area, who did their house, which you'll see later, and who I have worked with on many jobs. She was an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin in East and West, and they decided against her because the expression was, oh, Eleanor is so slow, that they wanted speed, and so they got fast architecture. Now, I, I worked with the building, but believe me, on, the, on certain areas, uh, uh, I really insisted that they, that they uh, on the outdoors for parking and so forth, which does not show in these slides. They had to redo what they had already done because it was idiotic. And I, I'm sorry I can't show you an example of that, but uh, you can find idiocy almost any place. <laughs> no, uh, so there was, this was not one of those jobs where there's close cooperation with the architect. Those are usually very good. Well, that's all right. Yeah, all right. But I mean, that, you, the conclusion you draw from it is uh, it should be just that the water goes right up to the building, not that the, the landscape architect goes right up to the architect. <laughs> Oh, there was. There was. With the building, uh, yeah. construction drawings. Yeah, but on the. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, th that uh, waterproofing was uh, really quite a simple thing, and we just did it. Uh, 
and there was there was no problem at all because the, the clients were terribly cooperative and those were the same ones who decided to break the law uh, that the, that the uh, uh, lighting people had that you just take 50 feet of land and uh, do nothing with it because sometime in the next 20 years they may have to bring a truck in and I'm sorry I don't have uh, uh, pictures to show of what we did because the uh, the tea house and the things that went on in that forbidden area are uh, I'm very proud of I you see, I, another little thing, that, a reason that I don't have it, is that uh, originally the book that I spoke of was going to be partly in color and partly in black and white. And the pictures that you see here are the ones that I was going to use in the color section. But then, in the process of doing the book, another thing where your plans go awry, or their plans go awry, it was changed. The, the thing is now totally black and white, which doesn't bother me at all, but it pleases them because it cuts down the cost of producing the book. But uh, I, I personally like black and white because I consider photographs a di diagrams, and black and white reads very well for me. And when it's uh, sugar painted with color, it, uh, it reads less well to me as a diagram. So that I like it black and white, and it's very clear. Uh, that's a personal preference, and I don't, uh, I'm not uh, anti-color pictures. But I, these are the pictures that I had left because of an original plan that the uh, uh, book would be partly color, so many pages in color. And that, that's why I have these pictures, and I don't have the complete coverage in, in uh, color pictures that are slides. Uh, and this is the way that things happen, and it's, it's not from no planning, it's from plans going awry. Uh, well, I, I hope I've covered everything about the nursery business trying to be something that they are not. You know, I, I, I think a good nurseryman is a great uh, contribution to society. But when he, th when he thinks he's God, uh, I have to defend God. All right, now I believe the next one is the one I <laughs> said would come up right away. Yes. Now, actually, this is the garden of the uh, owners of that corporate it's their private home. This is the swimming pool. Uh, they are terribly, I think, almost overly interested in uh, sculpture. They are, they are collectors. And uh, uh, usually I can catch it in time to place them. But when I can't, it, is not, it can become an obstruction. Anyway, that, that uh, metal circular object is a piece of sculpture. The uh, top platform there is a sitting platform that comes out from the living rooms of the house. In the uh, lower right is another piece of sculpture that they acquired, uh, which is by the side of the pool. And you'll see other views of this. Oh, gosh, I, I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button. There's a closer view that shows the two pieces of sculpture and the treatment of the different uh, levels. Uh, do you see that little island in the background? Uh, that is uh, uh, treated with rocks that were that the backhoe guy had buried, and we use them as riprap uh, among the planting. And it's, uh, and also the walks are made of those rocks. So that uh, it is, number one, a way of using what is there without throwing it away and then going out and buying something and bringing it in and so forth. Uh, that 
this and other close up. And uh, it doesn't show any detail of the rocks, but they are there and there. That is the platform, the redwood platform that was brought out in the house. You can just see the peak of the roof on the, on the left. And most of those trees were there. Now, these people were the type. The, for instance, on the first, uh, one of our first meetings, we walked the property, and there was some moss uh, on the ground and the woods, you know, and so forth. And they asked me, can you save that moss? Now, that, that sounds like a ridiculous thing to ask when you're going to build a house. Can you save the moss around it? But what it, the reason I mention it is it shows their interest in preserving what was already there. What's that mean? <laughs> what happened? Is it all right? All right. Uh, oh, I should stay over this way. All right. Uh, They, they were terribly interested in preserving what was there. Now, uh, that is, it is one thing to be terribly interested and concerned in that kind of thing. Now, are you willing to establish the kind of discipline on a job where you will really preserve it? And this is the question I asked them, because what I, I said, I, I'll be glad to save the moss and everything else around there, but do you realize that you're going to have a cement man coming in with bags of cement, and this is going to be a convenient place for him to dump them, and uh, other people are going to run trucks across it and so forth, and uh, it's going to be lost on that basis. The only way that you can preserve the site is to set up a rigid discipline, a driveway staked out that they have to use from the beginning, not make a mess and then come back and, and uh, try to bring it back, which never can be done, uh, that all these things have to be done, and you have to police it. Well, you know, I thought, that ends that. I won't have to bother. They'll, they'll just let the trucks come in any old way and so forth. But I didn't know them very well at that point. But uh, I, I didn't know Mrs. Paley that well. But she is one of the best policemen I ever saw in all my life. and if. Uh, uh, so that you found all these great big rough workmen, uh, if they hit a branch with their sleeve or something, they just uh, jump because Mrs. Paley might get them. And so she established her discipline, and we were able to preserve literally everything, uh, including the moss. And also, we had the driveway come in a different way so as not to ruin the, the wild part. Uh, but you see, uh, someone, one of the students today was asking about, do you antagonize the client? I, I, uh, the answer is no. I mean, I, I'm delighted when I find a, a client that will uh, be that cooperative and they put in a real, they have a real input on the job. And the job turns out differently because of that kind of client. And the one who says, oh, well, we want to preserve everything, but we don't want to police it. Because you can't have your cake and eat it, that's all. Uh, that, that gives you a little better view of the uh, pool. This indentation in the pool is where the steps into the pool come down. It's a reverse view of the other one. And the photographer put the sculpture in the foreground corner, but it, it gives you a, a, a good idea of relationships. And incidentally, in the in Beaux-Arts design, you cannot do this kind of thing. You have a picture view, and that's it. You go to another point and have another picture view. But in a... Uh, uh, garden that is done either like sculpture or, uh, uh, or done organically, 
uh, there's no such thing as, the, as one view. It is all, wherever you are, there's a new experience. And this is uh, uh, Rocky Cubana again. See, th there is the pool up there. And you, if you came out of the picture, you would be coming down some stone steps that are part of that stone arrangement into a viewing area for the tennis court. You'll see other parts of that. What's wrong? Is that the end of that? No, there should be more. Yeah, Murphy, yeah. I think O'Brien is in the corner, too. <laughs> Sunkenberg, yeah. Well, we're going to see Sunkenberg. I, I don't have a picture of him, except in my mind. No, with a name like that, you, you, you know. No, no. If they. Now, if, if uh, it's something he has to take some time with, he can turn on the lights and we'll, we'll do question and answer. Oh. Well, we could. If, all right. You think the time requires that? Well, maybe he's got that one fixed. You know, it's been like, oh, all right, all right, let's, shall I turn out this light? Okay, now this is uh, uh, my own house in suburban Ridgewood, uh, which has also violated all the rules. Uh, for instance, rule number one is <clears throat> that any kind of, what happened there? Uh, any kind of uh, uh, enclosure, uh, it is against the law to have any freestanding fence wall or anything else higher than four feet. So, uh, you know, Four feet is not an enclosure at all, because any kid over 10 years old can look right over it. And any adult who isn't a uh, midget can look over it easily, so that you have no six feet without really violating the law or at least so that they could give me a ticket. Uh, this is a picture of the house, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. So that it, it but I put it in to show the street and the, uh, uh, that the house is not, does not have a green lawn, foundation planning, and, and a walk coming up out to the street. That is a, a recent view of the same thing, uh, not, not the same view, but on the, the house is in there, but on the, uh, one of the great compliments that I get is when a, uh, the, a delivery man of some kind say, God, I had spent three hours trying to find your house. And I, I enjoy that a great deal because I, I like privacy. That is another view from across the street. There is one of those driveways with the uh, Belgian block uh, edging. Uh, but this is, since a fence has been put, and planting has been put on top of that two-foot retaining wall, and the house is right there, but you never know it. There is, in the middle left, a uh, 
parking area to pull into. That is the house across the street, which incidentally was started after we began building our house and ended before we finished because they had absolutely no trouble at all. They did absolutely nothing wrong. Of course, there's always the second clause in all those sentences. They did nothing right either. But they, they certainly didn't violate any of the uh, laws that the inspector could get them for. And incidentally, uh, the inspector's name is Sunkenberg, which is, just tickles me to death. Because I have, call, and I have called the article in the book that, that uh, takes this house as Sunkenberg. I don't call it Ridgewood, it's Sunkenberg. Now, this is a view down the, down the street, uh, you know, which you're all familiar with, uh, uh, suburbia standing there. Uh, and, uh, and I can't say there's anything wrong with it. It's just a question of uh, preference, taste, privacy, privacy uh, and a number of other things. Now, this is the walk going down along my property. Oh, gee, I left out the most important thing, that this uh, property is uh, uh, after you take the setback that's required by law, front, side, rear, and so forth, uh, the amount of property that is left that you are allowed to build on is the size of half a tennis court. And in the book, I'm calling it How to Build on Half a Tennis Court. And uh, uh, this is in closing. This is not on the building line, because you don't, you don't have to set back a four-foot fence. So I put the two-foot wall in the four-foot fence, and I didn't have to set back the six-foot fence. Now, this is the, the fence that is surrounding it. This is one of the entrances, the, which is really the front entrance. But because you are not allowed to park on the main street, uh, this entrance is practically never used. It's just an uh, enclosure for that portion of the house. Uh, th that's another legal requirement, that, that here, this is the front of the house. It is numbered on that street but you can't get in from that street. So they, they got sort of confused in their laws. That's another view of the same fence going the other way, because it's on the corner. Don't, oh, all right. Now, I mentioned before that there's a parking space that you come into for two cars, and this is the gate that lets you in through the fence. Uh, there are probably other pictures. There. Yeah, this is a, a view showing more of the parking and the fences uh, in the uh, right side. That is the picture of the of the gate taken by a different uh, photographer. Uh, I put it in to show the semantics that there are in even in photographing. But the, you see that little, uh, like, lantern in the upper uh, right, upper left, is a uh, copper quarter-scale model of a copper sculpture that I did for another job. This was the quarter-scale jo uh, job that I did, and they have the full-scale one. But I used this as a lantern at the entrance. There are also uh, later, a couple of stones that were brought in. This is after you go into the gate. Uh, there's a mural on the wall, and that is the house wall. That is the side view of it. And uh, in the dead center of the picture is a door, which could be called the service door, but it's the door that leads into the kitchen of the house. There you can see a detail of the outside mural and the detail of the inside mural after you go into the uh, uh, 
kitchen door. But this is inside, looking at the inside mural, and the shoji's giving screening privacy and pattern uh, from the uh, street. That is, uh, you can see in the uh, left-hand side is the mural again. And now you are looking at the front door. And that's that me standing there as a scale figure. Now, this, if you made a right turn, you would get the view from that same room, which is now a, a pool. And it's the same view in the wintertime. And a, a rock arrangement there. This is uh, Shoji's, which I mentioned the other day. That, uh, I, when I first built there, I couldn't afford to have thermothane. I put in plain plate glass with the idea of someday adding Shoji's, which would give the airspace that needed for insulation. And it works very well. But uh, the big thing about the shoji is that you get that wonderful pattern that, uh, or silhouette, or whatever you want to call it, that changes constantly. This is a, another view out that same window. You see the pool on the left and a stairway going up to the roof garden. This is from outside looking back to the living room of the main section of the house. That is the cross view looking to a, a fountain that is there that, that water falls into the pool that you saw. Uh, I don't, uh, John, how is, our, how is our time? Should I tell about the uh, poles and Mr. Sunkenberg and so forth? Or go all the way through it? Go, go right through. That is the uh, uh, fountain I was telling you about, and uh, the uh, waterfall going into the other pool. Uh, there you get a view through to an, uh, another stairway to the roof garden, and we'll be going up those stairs in a minute. There's a closer view of it showing the studio that is uh, one part, the north part, of a three-part house. It's the north studio, the central studio, and then a, a south one. And uh, this stairway goes up, and a bridge connects the roof garden on the north with the roof gardens farther south. That's the stairway going up, which is built without a nail in it. It's built with wood pegs and uh, cantilevers. And that is, those are two ponds, one on each side of that little fence. That's a down view from upstairs, looking down into the pools and, and uh, uh, showing the bridge going across, connecting the north with the other side. Now this is looking north into the north garden up on the roof. That is the one that was built last. Uh, this is not a piece of sculpture. It's a, it's a piece of driftwood, which uh, has been used. And go across the bridge, you're on a higher level, and step down to a second level. You can go across the bridge, you're on a higher level, and step down to a second level, uh, uh, which brings you back to the main section of the roof garden. That is a close-up on the north uh, garden which is, uh, 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 has a fiberglass uh, enclosure and reed fence on the side. And the, the ceiling is a, like a trellis, a sloping trellis uh, that's covered with fiberglass. And uh, the stonework in the foreground is a, is a lantern. <coughs> and that's a, another lighting view of the same same thing. 
gives a little better description, actually. This is from the linden roof, saving them so that somewhere in the house was built and I had to run around saving them so that somebody didn't decide to clear the site. I had to run around saving them so that somebody didn't decide to clear the site. But they have become very useful. Now this shows the, I mentioned before, the uh, two levels of that, the, the studio as a the upper level is the, what I call the north roof garden, and the, you come down to this area, and that level goes right through the whole house. Uh, I level as it goes right through the whole house. Uh, I put this in as a recall because we are still in suburbia, and I thought that this might be a good point to remind you that this house was across the street. This is now, uh, this is a view similar to the last one we saw of this place, looking back at the North Garden. This, now we are going the, uh, and as you can see from that bridge, you see back to the fountain and the waterfall and the uh, other body of fountain and the waterfall and the uh, other body of water that is down there. And this is uh, uh, across the bridge going south again. Now, this, I have to remind you, is all on, the house is on half a tennis court. The whole property is, uh, oh, much less than an acre. I, I, I don't, uh, like two-thirds of an acre, something like that. Uh, now this is from the inside of the house, uh, looking into a, a, a small garden, which is about 12 by 15 feet. And that wall is forbidden by the local laws to have a wall like that, even though it is within the building line of the house. You can't have a freestanding wall eight feet high. But by quizzing around, I found out that if you uh, had a roof on that wall and an enclosure in the form of a closet or anything, it would be permitted, but not a freestanding wall. So uh, that, on both sides of those walls became the utility closet that services the whole house. And in that way, we were able to have a wall garden. Otherwise, it wouldn't be permitted in Ridgewood. That is the same garden showing a stairway going up to the roof. This is a much easier stairway to go up uh, for people who are not very athletic. The other stairway requires some agility. That is, a, that is a, another view just before you go up those steps, looking across at the Buddha figure and back into the house. That is from the top of the steps looking down into the garden and house area. Now, once you arrive at the roof, this is a tea garden, and I, I actually got a building permit for that, uh, which I still have, and I'm, uh, which makes it absolutely legal for one year. Uh, after that, uh, uh, you aren't supposed to do any more building because the, the permit expires in one year. But I have often forgotten about that and just continued building. Uh, now, we'll see other views of this. I just would like to point out that uh, that figure, that silhouette up above, is a, a, a Zen Buddhist figure, uh, which uh, I was and, and still am interested in. It's a, a, uh, called Doksan. This is an interior view with the shoji's closed. And then I think we have one with, the, yes, that those same shoji's are now open, but it is backed up by a fiberglass 
uh, which lets in the light, but it keeps out the raccoons. Uh, and there you can see the, the roof pattern of the ceiling and the, the uh, silhouetted figure. And there's also a copper chandelier there, which I made with my own hands. And that is another view of the, a tree. It's a wild cherry tree that was there when we built, and uh, we have uh, built around it, really, so that one trunk of the tree comes into the area, and the other trunk is going out from it. It's, it's hard to see in that photograph, but it, it does, uh, it is very noticeable when you are there because one is shielded by the fiberglass and the other is right there. Oh, oh, all right, no. Uh, no, I don't think I want to go into that one. Or right. right. if so, later. I'd like to, to uh, have some light so that we can, uh, yeah. Um, this is the story of the uh, trouble you get into with rules and regulations, because you get into trouble unless you follow them exactly. And if you follow them exactly, you can end up with nothing other than what you saw in the houses on the same street, which had absolutely no trouble. And I think that that would be a very good mission for the ASLA to go into to see how this kind of thing can be changed because uh, it, it, it becomes a block, a design block. Because uh, they are really designing every inch of whatever you do. All you have to do is call them up and ask them uh, what the rule is, or look it up in the book. And then you do that, and you get what, the, what you see on the street in suburbia. And I, I'm quite sure that isn't necessary, or at least in this case, we avoided it. And uh, uh, I, I certainly would never be a landscape architect if I had to do uh, a green lawn, foundation planting, and a concrete walk going up to the street, which you would never get a summons on. But I would rather paper my walls with summonses. Now, is, is there any? Uh, <laughs> yes. OK. No, no, no. You have to have, you, you cannot get along without rules and regulations. But you can uh, certainly make them reasonable laws or flexible laws so that they don't become, so that they don't make a criminal out of your good intentions. Now, you, you must have, but only who makes them? You see, I, if you will come to Ridgewood sometime, I'll introduce you to Mr. Suckenberg. And you will see that uh, why the laws are the way they are. Because those are the people that make, that make such uh, laws. After I moved in there, see, that, that was a multifamily zone, a professional zone, and a religious zone. You could have a church, a, a professional office, or several families living there. Uh, I found after I was living there 10 or 15 years, I discovered that those, that law had been changed. It's now a single family, no profession, no religion, no anything. And uh, who did it? Well, if I went to every town meeting, I find out. But that's an awful price to pay. <laughs> and so, so but uh, they, you know, uh, I, there is a, a, a new writer. He's not young, but I mean, a new writer whose name I don't know. But he is writing about uh, uh, what we would do if we were invaded by Russia. I don't mean it just taken over. The country was taken over by Russia. Well, you can imagine the American reaction to that sort of thing. Uh, and it makes very, I, I'm sure his novels about it will sell millions of copies, because this is something that everybody sees as a, a, a contest, and they are interested in contests. But 
I don't think that's where the enemy is. I don't think there's anything like that going to happen. I think if you're looking for the enemy, you're lo you have to look inside your own thing. See, that's, that's what happened in Germany. There was no invasion of Germany. There was simply a takeover by Sunkenbergs. Well, you know, I, I make little mistakes like that. But uh, believe me, it's uh, not really a mistake. It's a threat. Yes? Well, uh, strangely enough, they uh, are very uh, happy, cooperative, and so forth. As a matter of fact, uh, on that, I was going to tell about those polls. I had put those up with, after talking it over with my neighbor on the one side, uh, on the property line to get privacy for both of us, I had put those poles in the ground without any nails, but I, I uh, as they are there without any nails, uh, I just stuck them in the ground so that they couldn't be called a fence because a fence is four feet high if you have the Ridgewood Dictionary. That's a fence, it's four feet. Anything over that is an illegal fence. So I put those poles in, uh, poles in there about eight, nine feet high. The neighbor's terribly happy, but I got a summons from Mr. Sunkenberg. I had uh, 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 built an illegal fence, and I went to court about it. And uh, I was given, uh, I, I told the judge, you know, you had a, a, a real court scene uh, where I explained that the fences, the fence laws had come from the spite fence, which happened when people built uh, fences to hide somebody else's view. And that was uh, back in the 18th, uh, 18th century that that happened in this country. And that's how you got the fence law, or this the spite fence law. This fence was, or this pole arrangement, not, I wouldn't call it a fence because it didn't have any nails in it, and by Webster's definition, it was an offense. So, but this was done with the consent of the other people. We both liked it. Nobody else was concerned at all. And he still said uh, the decision was that I had to take it down because it was his idea of offense. So, uh, however, he wanted to show that he was broad-minded, so he said he would come down and look at it and uh, reserve his decision until he had actually seen it. Now, Mr. Sunkenberg had said to me, when he gave the summons, that this uh, was dangerous because a, a child might come in there. He didn't add that the child would be trespassing, but I mean, a child might come in there and his pole fall on and hurt. Uh, that's hard to conceive, except in Sunkenberg's mind. But I'll tell you, when the judge came down, what I find terribly interesting, he used the exact same words. He said, you know, a child might come in and the pole might fall on it. And I could draw no other conclusion in my simple way but that they must have talked it over and made their decision without me or without his seeing it. It was all an inside job. So I started to take it down. And I got a summons for not having a permit to take it down. I, I, you know, I am not making this up. This happened. And so I uh, wrote them a letter. How can I obey the court, which told me to take it down, and still violate the law about having to have a summons. You know, if I have to have a summons, why didn't the court give me, you know, <laughs> why doesn't the court's mandate uh, make that legal for me to take it down? Well, they, you know, you get a letter like, in my case, they're going to make an exception. So I accepted their exception. And then I took the polls down because they had no nails in them. They were, they were, I paid four bucks a piece for them. And uh, uh, I s put them alongside of the carport in a pile about this high, that you could hardly see it. But I then got another summons for illegal storage. Mr. Sunkenberg wanted me to remove those poles from the property. Mr. Hitler, you get the point? <laughs> so. Uh, uh, then I took the thing. I would not go back to that court where the judge and Mr. Sunkenberg were acting like brothers-in-law. Uh, so I took it to Hackensack, the few towns over where they 
had a different uh, authority. And the thing was dismissed like that. A, a woman judge it was, and she said, this is the most ridiculous thing I ever heard tell of. And she rolled it out, she, you know, and, and when I got home, the phone rang, it was the Ridgewood News. They said, I understand that you had a court, a, a case with the town today, down in Hackensack. I said, yes. Now, how do you feel about it? I said, I feel as though I just had a bout, bout with fascism. And they printed it. And they also called Mr. Sunkenberg and said the same sort of thing. And he says, oh, I don't have any opinions. I just enforce the law. But it was printed about the fascism. And since then, I really haven't had any real trouble from him. I mean, apparently, it's got too close to home. I didn't call him Hitler. I just called him and said that it was a fascist act. So uh, this, these are the things that you have to deal with. It's not uh, the question of whether there's a dot on every T or a, a, every I in the plan is, is not the real thing that you're dealing with. And I'm not saying you don't have no plans, but I, that, that this is the reality that you run up against. Uh, <laughs> well, anybody would like to meet Mr. Sunkerberg? We have him here on a Monday night lecture. He'll set you straight. <laughs> okay.